everybody whose name is on the account is an owner of the account. That's a really important feature of a joint account. It creates ownership in everyone whose name is on the account. You see there's two owners, we'll keep it simple. Um, either could get an ATM card and start taking money out of a machine. Either can withdraw money, either can transfer money, either can take out all of the money in the account and close the account. <music>
or a more local organization like our Advocacy Centre for the Elderly here in Ontario, they put a special emphasis on the relationship of trust or a special relationship between the person who's abused and the abuser. Um, and here are some examples of financial abuse. Theft from a bank account, and that could be by using someone's bank card to withdraw money from an ATM, or forging checks or getting a person to sign checks that they don't want to sign, or the topic we're going to be talking about today, misuse of a joint bank account. It could also mean moving into someone's home without their permission and living there without paying any expenses or rent and refusing to leave. Uh, so those are just a couple of examples of the kinds of things that that are considered to be financial abuse. And when we're, we're thinking about prevalence, of course, over the years we've often talked about elder abuse in general being a hidden crime. It's been very hard to get good data on how prevalent it is, but a survey of research done here in Canada indicates that probably about 10% of seniors every year report themselves as victims of some kind of abuse and most of that abuse is property. property. Um, and financial and emotional abuse are considered the most prevalent forms of elder abuse in Canada and I, I should say that emotional abuse often accompanies financial abuse either as part of how it gets perpetrated or the consequences of it. Um, and when you're talking about persons over 65, 4.5% of them will report themselves as suffering some form of abuse over the course of the balance of their lives from 65 onwards. So it's a fairly serious problem. If we think about our own personal circles of friends and relatives and just people we know and neighbors and that kind of thing, we almost certainly statistically are likely to know someone who is being abused financially or will be abused financially within the next few years based on those statistics. So you, you said it's about uh, 10 percent. Now the interesting thing is that we had a discussion with the OPP on um, a general topic on fraud and one thing that the OPP uh, made a point about was that when you're speaking about the reported number, it's actually quite low and the actual problem is much la larger because in terms of fraud, uh, our OPP officer said it's just about 5% of the actual vi victims come forward. So it's, it's, um, can, it's most likely a very, very prevalent and very uh, profound problem, more than the numbers the statistics reflect. Well, that's right. And what you have to remember, Celia, is that the OPP hear about things that are criminal, or at least whoever's complaining and reporting it believes is criminal. And then there are a lot of other things that happen that never get reported to the police, as they've noted to you. Um, but they also may never come to anyone's attention in any other way because remedies in this area are not very accessible. And I know you're going to be asking me some questions about that at a later point in this interview, but it's important to remember that, you know, it is the tip of the iceberg that we're probably seeing that's reported and, and documented. So, Jan, you said that uh, elder financial abuse involves uh, uh, persons of trust. What kind of individuals are we looking at? Often individuals who are quite close to someone. It could be a child, a niece, a nephew, um, somebody who, a sibling maybe, uh, somebody who's fairly close to them. I find it's less common to see, if we're talking about joint bank accounts for example, less common to see um, a, a neighbor or friend become a joint owner of a bank account. Um, so on the topic we're discussing today, Celia, it's often a close family member. Mm. Yes, so that makes the issue very sticky because uh, <laughs> those relationships can be um, really, really messy. 
that's that's a good description for it in one word, sticky. I like that. We're focusing on joint accounts or joint bank accounts. What exactly are these uh, joint accounts? How are they different from your regular account? A regular account is usually in one person's name and they are the only owner of the account. A joint bank account has more than one owner, most commonly two owners, but sometimes you see more owners than that. Um, and so that's sort of the principal feature of a joint bank account. The other really principal feature of a joint bank account is that um, when one of the owners dies, the other owner or owners receive the interest of the first owner by right of survivorship. So the survivor becomes the sole owner. And um, I, I think it's really important for me to just note to you how I often see these accounts set up. Um, and they're often set up when a person um, is looking for maybe some assistance from a family member or the family member believes they should offer some assistance with paying bills or oversight of the person's finances. And someone somewhere suggests that a joint bank account would be the ideal way to do this. Um, and sometimes that suggestion, in my experience, even comes from somebody at a counter in a financial institution. Um, and so, you know, it certainly carries with it this, this suggestion that this is a really well thought through and sanctioned idea when somebody who appears to have some expertise has made a suggestion about that. But when I said earlier that everybody whose name is on the account is an owner of the account, that's a really important feature of a joint account. It creates ownership in everyone whose name is on the account. So it's not just access. It's not just, okay, my daughter is also on the account and so she can go and pay my bills, the money is there, it's very easy. It's not that. If I have $58,000 in the account, it's not that she's just able to pay the bills. She owns that $50,000 as well. That's hers. She has the same rights to it that I have. So I say there's two owners. We'll keep it simple. Um, either could get an ATM card and start taking money out of a machine. Either can withdraw money, either can transfer money, either can take out all of the money in the account and close the account. It's a very serious arrangement to enter into. Okay, so it's not, not just a simple thing that we should take lightly. <laughs> So, um, and this is a, an issue that you have been concerned about for a very long time. Uh, I had mentioned before we started recording that we, um, I was looking at a uh, magazine story, McLean's Magazine from 2011, in which you expressed some concern about how easy it is for these accounts to be set up. Um, and as you mentioned, someone over the counter, the bank might you know, suggest that if they're seeing someone having difficulty, they may be um, well-intentioned in saying, you know, you need some help with uh, getting your bills paid. Maybe you should set up a joint account. But you, you see that as problematic, the ease with which this is done. I do see it as problematic, yes. How easy, though, is it, and uh, is it possible that someone sets up an account by mistake or, or not quite understanding that they have set up a joint account? I think it's possible. Um, you know, I, I think that um, banking products can be quite confusing. Um, and um, I, I think I've heard numbers like your average bank employee has to be familiar with a couple of hundred different products. So it, it may be difficult when you're having a conversation with someone at a financial institution 
uh, to fully understand the implications particularly if you're being told up front by perhaps a family member who wants the account to be set up, this is just so I can help you. Right. I mean, it, it, that, that's maybe the messaging that people often hear, it's just so I can help you. There's some other messages that we can talk about that people hear in relation to why you should set up a joint account. Um, but uh, yeah, I, th I think that often there is a misunderstanding about what the implications are. Um, because there's more to it than just dealing with this bank account. There's vulnerabilities and risks that you create for yourself when you've set the account up. There's a term that I came across that is relevant in this area. It's uh, informed consent. Uh, how does that play out when we're talking about a joint account? It's interesting because we don't often think about informed consent when it comes to financial transactions as much as we do with respect to personal transactions. Um, but given the potential consequences of putting money into a joint bank account with another person, it's not wrong, it's not off the mark to say that, that you should really have proper advice and understand what the potential consequences are. My, my sort of first message to clients when I meet with clients and we're doing plans for you know their estate and that kind of thing is I always say if you, if you own something then don't put someone else's name on it if your intention isn't that they also own it. So I think that ownership should always like be the same as what the name is on the asset. And if, if the name on the asset isn't who you mean to have as the owner of the asset, then that's a red flag, right? If you're thinking to yourself, well, my son's not gonna own this account, I'm just putting his name on it for convenience, then you should be thinking, wait a minute, I saw that video and that lawyer said that that's a red flag, okay, <laughs> because it is. Um, I don't think people appreciate what can happen. We spoke a couple minutes ago about the fact that the uh, other owner of the account can take money out of the account without your permission and without your agreement. That's in fact theft. So you could be a victim of theft. But here's some other things that could happen. What if the person who you put the name of the account on, so you put them in as a joint owner, what if they owe money to a creditor and the creditor comes after them and wants to recover money and maybe even gets a judgment against them to recover money that they owe? Well, their name is on your account. The creditor could come along and get paid out of your account through legal processes and then you're left in a position where you're saying, well, wait a minute, that was my money. You're not entitled to that money, creditor. That money doesn't belong to my daughter. That belongs to me. Now, there have been cases where that's happened and where the parent has had to spend a lot of money in legal fees to prove that it was their money. So that's a risk you've got. You've also got the risk, supposing that your daughter is the person whose name you put on the account and she has an unstable marriage and then her marriage breaks down. Now, when she accounts for what assets she owns, when she's sorting out the separation of her property with her spouse, you've got a situation where, you know, the other side is going to see that she has an ownership interest in this account, and they may say that that has to count on the balance sheet towards the division of property between her and her spouse that she's in the middle of divorcing. So that's a complication that could affect you, will certainly affect the person that you're um, putting the joint ownership on. Here's another really important thing that people just don't think about. Everybody thinks we're all going to die in a certain order. So everyone thinks if they're old that they're going to die before younger people. But that doesn't always happen. Sometimes a younger person who's a joint owner on account dies. And what some people do is they try to make an estate plan that cuts corners so they might say, well, I've got this account. I'm going to put my son's name on this account. And then when I die, he's going to get this account. And then I'm going to put, 
you know, something else that's equal to that in value in my will to go to my daughter. Except then the son dies, and that account is coming back into your estate, but it's not going to go to your son's children because you haven't provided for that account or the equivalent of what's in that account to go to his children. So all of a sudden, it's not so much when you've talked about the first generation, but the next generation, you've skewed your plan for how your estate is going to be distributed because you counted on the fact that you would die first. People have a habit of not dying in the order that we plan for them to die in. Um, and then there's also, and this doesn't apply so much to bank accounts, Celia, but it's important enough I want to talk about it for a minute. Okay, There's also potential tax consequences that people don't think about. So supposing instead we were talking about an investment account that you hold perhaps through a bank, but it's not a bank account, and you decide to put your son or your daughter's name on it, well, arguably you've triggered a capital gains in that account when you make that disposition because you've given away an interest in the account. Now, there are people who do workarounds for that, um, but that costs money in accounting fees. It may cost money in legal fees. You may have to deal with CRA about that issue. So again, and, and at the end of the day, if there is a tax bill to be paid, and maybe there won't be, but if there is, that's a tax bill you would have paid after you were dead. So that's another favorite thing I say to people about joint owned property is like, why are you trying to save money on taxes that you're otherwise going to pay when you're dead? So it, you're exposing yourself to risk of losing your property. You're exposing yourself to risk of paying taxes that you wouldn't otherwise have to pay. And it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to do those things when there are alternatives available. That sounds actually kind of frightening <laughs> that you have, as a senior, senior your funds in your account and... Um, uh, there's a breakdown in your, let's say, your daughter's or your son's marriage, and then that becomes part of the uh, property that the ex-spouse makes off with. Or claims. How much have you come across that actuality in your practice? And what is the emotional toll that takes? Well, I have come across that issue in practice and I've also come across more broadly the issue of, of family members arguing over what it meant for an asset to be put in joint names and there's a very famous case that went to the Supreme Court of Canada um, that was the, the subject was the father having put his daughter's name on his investment accounts and she had, subsequent to that, divorced her husband, but her husband had been left on the father's will as a beneficiary of part of his estate. And the fight was about whether or not the assets that were in the joint investment account should be included in the estate and shared with the ex-husband for the purpose of distributing the estate. That fight was dealt with first as a result of a trial that went on for, you know, a number of days in Ontario, and then it went to the Court of Appeal, and then it went to the Supreme Court of Canada, and ultimately the Supreme Court of Canada decided that in fact the, the father had intended that she would receive what we call a beneficial interest in the joint account, and that she would get it by survivorship, and that it would not be part of his estate. But my guess is that probably cost a couple of hundred thousand dollars in legal fees. It took seven years to resolve. And I'm sure that, that the deceased father never had any intention that that much strife would be caused um, to his daughter and more broadly to his family. And that much money would be put in lawyers' pockets to resolve this. So, you know, we see a lot of fights about joint bank accounts um, in my area of work, but there's a really strong and graphic example of what the toll can be for someone. And as I said, the, the person who put the money into the joint account, they may be dead by then, but 
there's still a lot of, of stress and grief to be dealt with by the family members afterward. Is there any situation in which it's good for a senior to place someone else's name on his or her account? You seem to be against it totally. <laughs> I am pretty much against it totally. I, I, I was thinking, I'm tempted to say never, but I, I think we should look at some of the reasons why um, people decide to put things in joint accounts and, and talk about those reasons, because then we can think about, you know, what the alternatives to that are. Um, and one, of course, we've talked about already, which is about helping to pay bills. You know, there are other ways to arrange for help in paying bills. Sometimes it makes sense that some bills will be paid automatically out of a person's account. Um, but there's also documents called powers of attorney, so you can actually give another person a power of attorney so that they can deal, if necessary, with your account if something happens to you. Um, and what I like about a power of attorney arrangement is that it's clear whose money it is and it's clear what their responsibilities are, that they're functioning as a fiduciary and that they have duties to the person who owns the money. So powers of attorney are a very complicated topic and we're not going to talk about them at length in an interview like this, but it is an alternative. Um, another reason I see a lot of is that people will say to me, well, I want there to be money available for my funeral. So I've just put this little nest egg in a joint account with my daughter so that when something happens to me, they, she can pay the expenses immediately for the funeral and, um, you know, she has money available to pay for my son to fly from Vancouver or whatever it is. Um, and so, so there, you know, I, I understand completely wanting to spare our loved ones, having to have any stress around paying for our funeral and our burial. And a lot of my clients make prepaid arrangements for that kind of thing to spare their family members the trouble. I, I, I find it's interesting. My clients will sometimes say to me, they'll spend far too much money. I would rather like pay for it now because I know how much money I want to spend and it's not nearly as much as they'll want to spend. So that's an interesting thing as well. Um, but the other thing, and a lot of people don't know this, is that when the funeral home, when you make the arrangements with the funeral home, if you get them to give you an invoice and you take it to the bank, the bank will pay the funeral home directly for the cost of the funeral. What they won't do is reimburse you if you put it on your visa card. So, you know, I think people feel a lot of pressure when the funeral home says this is how much it costs, here's the invoice. They feel like they have to pull out their credit card and pay it right away. But they don't actually have to do that. It's quite reasonable to say, you know, can you just give me that invoice and I'm going to go to the bank. I'm going to get the bill paid right away. Um, so I don't think funeral homes always tell people that, but that's a way of doing it. And then sometimes other people will have expenses and you're just going to have to wait until you have access to funds to reimburse them. So there are ways to plan around some of those expenses. Another reason people do it is to avoid, in some provinces and territories, what are called either probate fees, or we call it in Ontario the estate administration tax. And that's a tax that is paid on the assets that are in the estate for the purpose of the person who's the executor getting the piece of paper that they need from the court to show that they have the authority to deal with the estate. And in Ontario, which has the highest fees in the country, it's 1.5% of the value of the assets in the estate. Um, so, um, you know, uh, it's not nothing, right? On every $100,000 in the estate, it's $1,500 that have to be paid in the estate administration tax. Um, and, you know, people are often hearing from the next generation, you know, we could save money and not have to pay that tax if you would just put my name on the account and don't worry about it. I'll just make sure that the money goes to the right people after you die. I'll distribute it to my siblings or whatever, right? You know, I think we have to have a little bit of perspective about this. You're, ren you're making those assets, like that joint and bank account, vulnerable now. Vulnerable to all the things we've already talked about, Celia, like theft or claims from creditors. And 
this is all to save someone else money after your debt because you're not going to save the $1,500 on the $100,000. You still have that money in your pocket right now, and you will until you die. But if you kind of put someone else's name on it, you've created a risk for yourself that you didn't have the day before you did it, and all to save someone else money. And by the way, as I said, those are the highest taxes in the country. In many places, their taxes are much lower, and there may even be a flat fee. But what I sometimes say to clients is, say you have an estate of $500,000 and that tax is going to be $4,500, you can't even buy a good used car for $4,500. So you've traded your financial security for a bad used car. Like That's not a very good choice when you think about it in those terms. So I, I don't think it's a good idea, but I've certainly been asked about situations where somebody, for example, knows they're dying. And this doesn't happen very often, but sometimes somebody has been given a terminal diagnosis and know they're going to die fairly soon, and they decide that they want to put their assets into joint names with family members because now they feel that, that imminently the distributions can happen then, and there's not a risk that they're going to lose their money before they die because they're going to die soon. I don't quarrel with people who want to do that. I understand why people would want to do something like that. So I can see some value in doing that if you're certain of your diagnosis and you don't expect to live for very long. I'm not sure that it would be my top priority in my my remaining days, but it depends on, on how strongly you feel about avoiding the tax and what kind of peace of mind you might like to have by sparing your family having to deal with complications in administering your estate, right? So there's an example of when you might do it. Okay, so that's something for seniors or golden uh, individuals looking at goldenvoices.com can think about. When we look at the joint account, let's say someone did go ahead and set up a joint account. It's not a situation where uh, their passing is imminent. They have many years to look forward to. Is there anything that can be done once the joint account is set up to uh, escape any of those negative consequences we spoke about earlier? Creditors of the other person, the spouse, is there anything you can write and give to the bank that can save you? I've done this a few times for clients where we, after the fact, have um, the client and the other joint owners enter into a written agreement that confirms who is the beneficial owner. So there's a difference in law, as you may know, Celia, between being a legal owner and being a beneficial owner. And Actually, usually, I could do I could do with a a little refresher explanation okay. and expansion on that. Yes. <laughs> well, usually, usually we're owners of both, right? We own. If we own something, we, we're the legal owner, our name is on the title, but we also own the benefit of that asset. Uh, but sometimes there's a division between those two things, and the person who is registered as the legal owner may not actually have the beneficial ownership. The beneficial ownership may belong to someone else. Most commonly, that's a situation that we call a trust, where... Um, the person who's holding the title is holding for the benefit of another person who's called a beneficiary. So um, what I've sometimes done is I've had everybody enter into a legal agreement that regardless of what has been done in terms of the ownership structure, that the only person who is a beneficial owner is the parent, for example, who was the original owner of the account. And everyone else is only a legal owner and only for, I call it, administrative purposes. Um, and, you know, I haven't had the experience of watching a court fight happen around an agreement that I've drafted, um, but that may be because we've already been very clear with everyone up front. I would say, though, that if you're going to do a written agreement, it's probably better to do it before you transfer the asset into joint names. I mean, your question was about, well, what if I've done this and now I kind of want to make it better? And I've had lots of people's children who are quite happy to sign 
when this is presented to them, and we always encourage them to get their own legal advice. Um, but it it is ideal if you've thought of it ahead of time. If you really, really want to have a joint account, think about it ahead of time and, and get something put in writing. Uh, I think that is golden advice, that if someone is going to have a joint account, they've decided that this is necessary, before doing that, have this... Uh, clear statement of intentions and who owns what or who is the beneficial owner and um, that should be done ahead of time but if it's a situation where someone is saying oops <laughs> I already have this joint account um, they should get in touch with maybe you or a good lawyer where whichever province they're in and ensure that these intentions are clearly stated Yes, and there's another point to make about that, Celia. Remember I was talking about that case that went to the Supreme Court of Canada and, and it dragged on for seven years? So one of the things the Supreme Court of Canada said when it decided that case is that um, there's actually a legal presumption that um, if a parent transfers something into joint names with a child, that the child holds it in trust, holds their interest in trust for the parent. And if you want to rebut that presumption, you need to have evidence to the opposite effect. So documenting your intentions is helpful regardless of what those intentions are, because what we sometimes see are fights that happen after the fact, as happened in that case, about what the parent actually intended. And it's a lot easier to understand what somebody intended when it's in writing and you've been clear about what you mean. So you may mean, in fact, it's mine now. I'm only putting my child's name on it for administrative purposes. Or I may be putting my child's on, name on it so that someday whatever's left in that account can be theirs. Or I may be saying, I want them to actually hold on to it, but I want them to give shares to their siblings. So you might have a number of different things that you want to say, not just that it's yours now. So th these are the kinds of things that can really prevent ugly fights in families at a later point in time. Those fights can be uh, really uh, dramatic and traumatic for families. So getting the intentions down with a little bit of time, expert help, and um, setting things out that can really save both uh, you know emotional turmoil as well as the, the links the bonds in families you mentioned earlier uh, when we were talking about what can go wrong uh, and that person in a role of trust taking the money for themselves and you said it's theft uh, is that something that you can take to the police if you are a senior and someone has betrayed your trust and the money is gone, can you go to the police and say, help me, help me re first recover the money and bring this person to justice? I think it is a good idea to go to the police. Um, the police need to know what's happening in the community and they may be able to help you because there may be some fraudulent elements to what happened um, that can be pursued and investigated and prosecuted. But a criminal case may be very difficult to prosecute when money has been taken out of a joint account because the other owner is an owner. So they've taken assets that belong to them as well as to you. So, um, you know, the police are only going to ultimately prosecute a case where the evidence is clear enough. Um, you can sue in the civil courts, but that's going to cost you money. And, you know, if someone else is claiming against that money, like a creditor, you can defend yourself, but that's going to cost you money. So, you know, again, we have to consider what the consequences are of the simple act of adding someone's name to an account. Um, and I suppose, you know, it's the usual, the horses are already out of the barn situation, and it's going to cost you something to get your money back. Yes, so it can be 
that you're in a lot of trouble, a lot of hot water, if it comes to that where someone has taken the funds or a creditor is after uh, the other holder of the account. And a final area I wanted to look at, Jan, was um, let's say it hasn't, uh, it's not a full blown problem, but the senior is realizing that things could get problematic. You're seeing little bits of funds disappearing, and you know that that's probably going to snowball. Is there anything, once a joint account is set up, a senior can do to reverse that? Apart from, we spoke about the um, documenting that this person is supposed to be just in an administrative capacity. Can you switch it off, that joint account? Yes. Well, for my first piece of advice would be talk to your financial institution and ask them for advice. Um, because they have their own rules and, and procedures. But I would be looking to move my money out of an account that was joint if I decided I didn't want to take the risk any longer and move the money into an account in my name alone before the other owner does that. Um, and if there's any difficulties in doing that for some reason or another, um, you might want to think about at least stopping the flow of money into the account. So often we're talking about an account where someone's pension or old age security CPP payments are being deposited. So you might need to set up a new account and redirect the flow of money into the new account so that regardless of what's happened with the funds that are already in the account, there's no new money flowing in to the joint account. But in, in most cases, you should be able to close that account as, as an owner of the account and transfer the money elsewhere and do that before someone else does. Because I've seen the opposite happen. I've seen the account get cleaned out before the original owner is able to, to do something to protect the account. So take action if you see warning signs and uh, protect your resources, your assets. Thank you very much. So those were the main areas that I wanted to uh, look at uh, that I had on my list. Is there anything that we haven't uh, touched on that you believe that seniors should consider when we're talking about elder financial abuse and specifically through the um, incorrect use of joint accounts? I would probably just like to go over the main messages um, and this is what I do with my own clients. I say to them, you know, five years from now, you're not going to remember why I told you not to put money in joint bank accounts with your children. But just remember, I told you that, you know, <laughs> now, not all the people watching this video are my clients. And I, I don't think I could handle it if they were because it'd be too many of them, I hope. Um, but, but, you know, I, I will also say to them, you don't have to remember all the reasons why you have a free pass to call me again and ask me, and I'll tell you again why you shouldn't do it. And I actually had one client who did that one. She said, I know that you told me to call you if I, if I were ever thinking of doing this and ask for your advice. Um, and um, she said, can you remind me why you told me not to do this? And so I went through it. And she goes, oh, okay, that's great. Thank you. And we were done. Um, but again, like the main things I say over and over again to people is, the only names that should be on an asset are the names of the people who you actually intend to own the asset. If your intention isn't to give that asset to somebody today and make it theirs, don't put their name on it. Don't take a risk in your lifetime to save somebody else money after you're dead. That's their problem, not yours. Don't make it your problem. And don't trade your financial security for a used car. Because, you know, in the end, all this stuff that you hear about money that can be saved by, by transferring the assets now into someone else's name, it, it's not a huge amount of money that you're saving compared to the risk you're taking. So, so one thing I see a lot of is um, couples who are um, in second marriages um, or, or sometimes third or fourth marriages, but in any event. Um, and there are children from first marriages and then these couples. Um, 
oftentimes they have made a marriage contract and they've agreed that they're going to be separate as to their property in their second marriage um, to protect the property they have, to pass it on to the next generation in their first family, for example. Um, not always, sometimes there isn't a contract, but over time, sometimes these couples also start setting up joint accounts. And, you know, married couples of all ages, whether it's a first or a second or a third marriage, often have joint accounts that they use to pay household bills and common expenses. So that's not unusual at all. Um, but I have seen repeatedly second spouses' names on joint accounts as a source of conflict in families between children of first marriages and second spouses um, and a lot of confusion about intentions and often as I said there may be a household account right from the beginning of that marriage but five years later all of a sudden there are more accounts with the second spouse name on it and or there are GICs with the second spouse name on it um, and and these become sources of conflict they may be very deliberate choices on the part of the original owner of the asset. If they are, it would be a good idea to make sure that everyone who possibly could have an interest down the road is aware of the intentions or perhaps you've amended your marriage contract so that it's clear as to what the intentions are because we do see a lot of disputes that arise afterwards about the ownership of those assets. Um, and, you know, I'm not saying you shouldn't deviate from your marriage contract and start giving more assets to your second spouse. I, I, that is not what I'm saying at all. But what I'm saying is that if you want to avoid future conflict in your family and think about the stress that might cause to your spouse, um, then you probably should do it in a very thoughtful way and make sure that it's well documented and understood by persons who later will have to figure it out. That's an important point and one that... Uh... Uh, many people can relate to because we're living in a world today where uh, families are, you know, it's not one nuclear family that goes through um, all of time. There are lots of blended families and as you say, first, second, third marriages. And so that's really a relevant point to many people. Thank you so I'm much. I'm glad I brought it up. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. Okay, that's a wrap. Okay. All right. Today we've had the distinct pleasure of having as our guest Jan Goddard. She is the founding partner of the law firm Goddard Gamagay LLP in Toronto. And we have been speaking about elder financial abuse and specifically abuse with respect to joint accounts. I am Celia Sanka, Executive Director of the Diversity Canada Foundation, the organization that brings you goldenvoices.com, where you'll find this fireside chat and others in the Golden Years fireside chat series. See you next time. Take care. Till then. Bye for now.